Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Glad you could join me and our guest, Todd Agnew. More on him in just a moment. I'm Scott Linden, the host of the television show Wing Shooting USA, as well as this new Upland Nation podcast. Uh, hope you've told your friends about it. If you're here for the first time, welcome. We've got a great show in store for you. About now, everybody's kind of itching for opening day. I know a few of you have been chasing roughies or maybe even a prairie grouse or two and uh, hope you had a good one. But for the most uh, part, we're getting geared up right now. Are you ready? Is your dog ready? Well, you'll be more ready at the end of this podcast. Todd Agnew joins us from Craney Hill Kennels in Mitchell, Georgia. We're going to focus on spaniels and spaniel training, but we'll also have, of course, a public access tip, some dog handling advice for the bunch of us, and uh, a whole bunch of hunting suggestions and uh, a, um, well, let's just call it a good time talking spaniels, one of my favorite subjects. So hang on just a moment. We'll be right back. And this part of the podcast is brought to you by my good friends at sageandbreaker.com. They make those great uh, heirloom quality gun care and gun cleaning products all wrapped up in cool stuff like wax, cotton, and leather. Learn more about them at sageandbreaker.com. Sign up there for the mailing list and you'll get some new product announcements before the rest of us schlemiels ever hear about it, sageandbreaker.com. And welcome our newest sponsor, ESPamerica.com. If you turned up the volume on this podcast right at the beginning, maybe it's time you investigated your hearing and the potential for hearing loss. I'm a believer I wear my ESP hearing protection custom-fitted, Every time I pick up a shotgun, those things are in my ears because once you lose it, you will not get it back. Yes, I know. It's not as convenient or as cheap as those little foam plugs, but there is a massive difference in the protection and the ability to hear everything else. Learn all about it at ESPAmerica.com. Thanks to everybody there for protecting my ears, and hopefully you will learn something as well. Okay, thanks for sticking around. Uh, I will uh, now officially welcome Todd Agnew. He's the proprietor at Craney Hill Kennels in Mitchell, Georgia. Todd, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. And you are in between uh, obligations right now that uh, may be of interest to us. Tell us what uh, you know. Wh- what kind of a day a spaniel trainer has uh, this time of year, as we're getting geared up for for actual real hunting. Oh, currently we're spending a lot of time with clients uh, because everybody's getting geared up. So they're coming in to check on their dogs, pick up dogs, swap out dogs. Uh, we're trying to fine tune. Uh, this is where their dog is at this given time frame. And these are the things they should expect uh, for their dog to comply with. And these are the things that they shouldn't worry about and just deal with. Uh, very rarely are we able to have everything together uh, on any given time frame. So we're just trying to, what's the goal for the fall, the objectives, and try to meet those, and let's just concentrate on those, and then there are other things that we'll have to clean up or get back at or more advanced type of training uh, when the season's done. You know, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty active in our local NAVDA chapter, and uh, and within that chapter, there's a small group that comes over here every Thursday night, and we work on all sorts of stuff. And as the season approaches, I'm telling them much the same thing. Um, but do you, for the most part at least, uh, barring some just egregious errors, are you suggesting that the training season ends the day we start carrying a a loaded gun and we're in the woods and actually hunting? Um, Not per se, but the reality is that the hunting is everybody's field trial. It's what you spend the rest of the year working for and for the dogs as well. So once you get there, it's, it's hard to fix problems when you're hunting because it's an environment that clearly is not as controllable as a training. So if you get too wrapped up in trying to fix some imperfections that weren't put in place prior, uh, quite frankly, it's a little unfair to the dog. 
And then it's also a little bit unfair to you. Ever, nobody that I know anyway <laughs> gets to hunt as much as we'd like to. So when you are out there, uh, why not enjoy your time? So just accept that uh, you don't shoot as well as you'd hoped you would. And the same way, you need to accept that maybe your dog doesn't retrieve as well as you had hoped or doesn't listen quite as crisp as, as you had hoped. I mean, enjoy this time and then get back at it. Um, I think you just answered the question. Just to, just to put a fine point on it, though, our poor dog at the end of the season is going to have backslid a little bit, but not to the point of permanency. And Is that what I'm hearing from you? For the most part, I, I think that there are some some things that can get progressively worse during the hunting season uh, that allow them to continue certainly is not helping you. Uh, but for the most part, if the foundation is in place, everybody's dog is going to be looser at the end of the year than the beginning of the year. And with that foundation, you're relying on that foundation to then next year start to put the dog back together so you can start the year better off than you'll end the year i love it um uh, thank you now we all we will all feel better on opening weekend (laughs) (laughs) Uh, now now i want to get to you specifically craney hills can craney hill kennels in mitchell georgia by the way if you if you want to learn more about todd and christina his spouse and what they do and why they do it and how they do it which i'm fascinated with spaniel training dot com now how long ago did you have to lock up that url todd <laughs> uh you know i i don't know i'm not an internet guy but, you know christina does all that website stuff anything anybody sees any podcast that's all christina i just okay. you know I, I try i train the dogs i you know I try to be good at that. I'm not good at the other stuff. I love it. Well, good for you, Christina, and thank you for pulling this all together for us yeah. as well. You know, um, but that leads to the the, the, the most obvious question. Uh, you know, you tell us you're not a retriever trainer that trains a few spaniels. Your your spaniel trainers. Uh, How did you get into the business? Uh, like a lot of people, I grew up hunting and fishing. And like a lot of people, I thought our dogs were great because we put birds in the bag. Um, after college and chasing money and, you know, the, the usual evolution kind of fell back towards what interests me. And I had a lab at the time. And I ran into some guys that lived in Pennsylvania. We were hunting ducks on the Delaware River. And these guys showed up. I didn't know who they were, but they had spaniels. And I'd never seen one in my life. And those dogs were breaking ice and jumping off of cliffs. And I was like, you know. That's a little bit more exciting to me. So uh, I want one. And one was two and three and five and quit your job and, you know, the usual the usual course there. Yeah, there's no 12-step program quite yet <laughs> right. for us, is there? No, no. <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you, I watch a, a few of your videos because uh, I, I just, uh, if, if you know my television show, we have, lately, the last few seasons at least, have been able to hunt with spaniels in one way, shape, or form, either alongside a pointing breed of one sort or another, or just by themselves in a pheasant field. And I, I get this kind of, kind of adrenaline rush, just watching these extremely excited, very likable dogs who appreciate everything you do for them that puts them in the field. Is, is that part of this whole spaniel affinity for you? Um, I think that, it's easy to gravitate to something that brings us enjoyment. Uh, I've got dear friends that run pointing dogs, have been very good with pointing dogs, uh, but it just doesn't do it for me. I respect it. I think it's really cool. I think the fact that a dog can hold point at a half mile and you know not flinch uh, is incredible control and training and all those things. I, I think that uh, you know, Mike Lardy can send a dog on a blind retrieve for 300 plus yards through all sorts of, you know, changes and factors. And I get it. That's incredibly remarkable level of training as far as I'm concerned. But on all of those things, I just don't feel as actively involved in the team as I do with the Spaniels. Now, somebody else may view it differently, but, you know, with the Spaniel, uh, if that dog is not with you, you don't get to shoot anything because it'll all get put up out of range. At the same time, if you're on the dog too much, the dog runs over your boots and there's no reason to have the dog. So I think it's a, uh, my personality is a little on the go 
and the spaniel personality also is a little bit on the go so i like that i like that they jump and you know they want to jump on me and they're a little goofy and that suits me but i also like being part of the team you know it's funny i describe it in in a in a slightly with slightly different words but it's the same feeling you're you're almost always ready for a flush when you got uh spaniels in front of you uh your gun's got to be locked and loaded safely of course but uh, but unlike a pointer breed uh, guy and i am one and i'm a big believer but you can walk around with your your double gun broken and on your shoulder until hey look over there and it's fun to have the choice uh and maybe that's something we should talk about just for a moment. I know it's hard because I've seen it happen, but have do you ever train flushers to work with pointers? We we have. Uh, it, it's kind of the current rage. Yeah. You know, we get a lot of yeah. phone calls. Everybody everybody wants to do that. Um, in the south here, it has really saved a lot of the quail hunting, to be honest. Yeah. There's something about a dog, not necessarily a spaniel, but a dog going in to flush the quail has a way, for whatever reason, of making poor birds look good. So for a lot of the plantations that clearly are using, you know, pre-release, release birds, whatever you know term they want to use, it has made poor birds a better shoot, safer Okay, um, as opposed to, you know, we've all seen people try to go in and flush quail and they just keep running around and then it becomes unsafe. You're in front of the guns and all that other stuff. So there's something about the dog that makes that a better presentation. The, pro the problem we run into, Scott, is that in most cases, they're just having dogs run around and make noise. Mm -hmm. They're not particularly well trained and you know, if someone gets to shoot birds and the dog brings it back, uh, then they're wiser to what's going on. And so everybody has a good day. If the training was better, it would be less chaotic. Amen to that. And I know exactly what you mean. I was at a plantation in Florida a few years back and, and I said, you know, you guys, usually those people will use you, you people will use Labradors to do the flushing because it was right in that transition transition that mm -hmm. you just alluded to. And they said, yeah, we used to do that. But you know what we find is we find that the, the cockers in particular, they can get into that palmetto and they get under it and they push the birds up instead of out. That gives all the guests a little bit more, um, I don't know what to call it, a, a value, fun. Well, well, certainly, if the bird goes up, less people get shot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's just a it's, it's simple tra trajectory. Dogs don't get shot. So I, 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 I get it. I, I mean, I get it. But, but a lot of the people that are asking for it, I think they just lack some education on what's involved. I think the most difficult part of it is the pressure that's put on a pointing dog. Yeah. The cocker doesn't care. The springer, they don't care. But for a pointing dog to sit there and have these dogs constantly running in front of them and stealing their birds, that's a lot of stress on a pointing dog. Now, you know, if, if you're a good trainer and you don't let them slip, sure, it can be done and it can be done continuously. But you just got to understand you're asking a lot from that pointing dog. Amen. And that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy of that. I'll never get to that point. The people who do, Hey, more power to you. Sure. Sure. You know, you used a term, um, on your website that I'm intrigued with because I, uh, I wrote a book about it and that is, uh, uh, the, di the difference between training and what you call development. You want to explain that to us? Um, I think in the simplest form training is you know, getting the dog to do a task. And, you know, old school, you made dogs do things. Well, as time has gone by and, you know, the, the hunters and the, the field dog people have softened a little bit in the approaches they use, the advent of the e-collar, you know, changing from just on or off to multiple levels and different, you know, ways to use it and vibrate and tone and all those things. And then the clicker and, you know, we just know a lot more now than we once did. And so I think that good trainers actually develop dogs. And, and being in the business, it's always a struggle because very few people are going to send you a dog and come pick it up when the dog is three years old. So development is a loose term, 
but our own personal dogs that we are developing and then we're going to sell them as trained dogs either on the circuit or as a you know class shooting dog or whatnot um, those are developed because they hear all the time and what we mean by that is that we are in no rush we're not trying to get the dog to do a b c at any given time we're trying to develop the dog's workman type attitude and then we know we will get there if we can't develop a dog that wants to go to work not does go to work wants to go to work then it's going to be very hard to get that dog to a very high level so how do you do that i mean i don't care whether it's a retriever it's a german wirehaired pointer raw or or <laughs> a, or an english cocker field bred cocker spaniel how do you get that dog to want to go to work instead of have to go to work well this can be contrary to what everybody thinks but for us it's by ignoring the dog um, instead of giving your attention away the dog has to do things the dog has to choose behaviors that earns your attention clicker treat that's what that's all about the dog is choosing to, to perform certain behaviors and when it does it gets a treat a clicker a good boy whatever you're going to use as your marker and so the dog is actually teaching itself that certain behaviors give the dog what it wants i.e the treat pet kind voice and whatnot once you have a dog that will do that problem solve you know, trainers all over the country you know there's always a buzzword if you don't have a buzzword you can't market yourself but the bottom line is you're trying to get the dog to get what it wants and we want to use that drive that all dogs have to get the dog to do what we want if the dog is doing it because they believe they made the decision and it works for the dog they'll be more apt to replicate that behavior when there's distractions. You know, I, I've heard variations on that philosophy uh, from various great trainers, but the bottom line is exactly what you said. And let me sum it up and check me if I'm right or wrong on this. The dog has to figure out for themselves. The dog has to think for themselves uh, to a great degree if you expect them to reach that highest level. Is it, am, I, am I on the right track there? Yeah, at the highest level, the dogs are going to have to do things that are contrary to their genetics. So the most common one with a flushing dog is there is nothing genetic about being steady to wing and shot. Mm -hmm. A flushing dog is trying to catch everything. That's They're not trying to flush birds to us. They're not only trying to find roosters for us or any other stories that you hear people talk about. They are trying to catch game. So the aspect of them, then when game escapes, to sit down and not move, that is not genetic. Therefore, if the dog is faced with that problem and it doesn't have the, the ability to solve problems, then it's going to break down. Okay, the, obviously you're familiar with Delmar Smith and Rick and Ronnie and those guys and they have their silent command training. It's real simple. They want the dog to perform a behavior before they overlay a verbal cue or command. We're living that right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I get it, and it, it makes so much sense. I mean, it really does. Uh, but just let's get concrete for a moment here. By the mm -hmm. way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. That's Todd Agnew with Craney Hill kennels and you can learn more about him at spanieltraining.com so todd let's just take that steady to wing and shot thing with your with a spaniel so well, how are you uh, sublimating the instinctive desire to just crash in or we want him to crash in i forgot that then stop and wait for somebody to tell them to go retrieve. How, what, what is, how, where's the payoff for the, the dog in that transaction? Um, very little, if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, to, yeah. To, to be honest. So the, fundamentally, all that is is hop or sit. Depending on, you know, Spaniel people say hop as a general rule. Most of America thinks of it as sit. So whatever your command is, that's all it is. Steady the wing and shot is nothing more than obeying the sit command. Obviously, it's obeying it at a very, very intense moment. That dog, though, has got to figure out, okay, if I do this for him, mm -hmm. at some point I'm going to get a reward. Yes. So in the beginning, 
the reward is for the sit or the hop, clicker, treat, petting the dog, you know, something that is rewarding to the dog. Um, I am not a particularly strong believer that the retrieve is the reward. I mean, I think dogs do like to go out there and get game, but it's not the way that we want to believe it. I don't think the dog says, oh, if I sit, great, now I can go get the retrieve and I really want the retrieve. Dog wants the retrieve because nature has told it if it gets that, it can run off and eat it. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. So it's, it, it's just, it is a reward to the dog. It's just not the human way that we view those things. So for us, if we say hop or sit, the dog anticipates that it is going to get something positive in its life. Now, that could be the bird, but the foundation begins with it's going to be, a, for us, it's going to be a clicker and treat. We, we have three young puppies in the house right now, uh, all less than three months old. At 5 a.m. every morning, I'm in the kitchen doing clicker and treats, sitting on boards, walking along the cabinets at heel, running in and out of kennels, coming when they're called, grabbing things out of my hand. I'm just working on, you know, an endless array of little stupid pet tricks, let's call them, because all I'm doing is building my relationship. I am developing their desire to try things, to perform different behaviors in an effort to get what they want. But yeah. it's as simple as hop. That's the reward. Yep. Um, you know, whether it's um, um, it, it, it lab rats learning to get the cheese at the end of the maze or or a spaniel puppy learning to sit because eventually they're going to get whatever it is they want at that point in their development. It's it really is. Oh, what do they call that? The operant conditioning, really. Isn't that's it? all. That, yep. That, that, that's exactly what it is. I will say as a breed that I believe two things about the spaniels. Um, they are particularly food driven. Okay. So that works to our advantage, mm -hmm. uh, provided you make them work for it. Otherwise they'll get lazy about food. Um, and they're very people driven. That's one of the reasons they can manipulate, particularly the cockers and take advantage of people so easy. Who doesn't look at a cop, cock, uh, excuse me, a cocker and laugh. Right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, just them moving on the ground, you can't help but smile. Well, that's going to get used against you. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> okay. So true, but we're all guilty of it. You're absolutely, absolutely. right. Absolutely. Um, Todd, I'm going to ask you to hang on for just a moment, uh, and I'm going to ask all my listeners to hang on, but they must pay attention, careful attention, to the commercial messages that will be coming along momentarily. And in the meanwhile, we've got lots more with Todd Agnew of Craney Hill Kennels and our Handle It discussion coming up right after this very important break and as i said the handle it segment coming up but not until we handle our dogs in a safe manner on the road dakota 283 kennels uh, and their website dakota 283.com learn more about their new lower pricing one of my favorite subjects and also you know, you never think about this until uh, you think about it. Uh, some of the other guys are using those big black plastic doors on their dog crates. And basically what it means is you can't see in there and figure out what the heck your dog is doing or not doing. At Dakota 283, it's a stainless steel wire door and the locking mechanism as well. So if you're out in the weather... Nothing's going to happen to that. And you can see your dog, figure out what he's doing in there and keep him safe, whether you're on the road or in the house. Dakota283.com. Remember, still got the free forever insert. Use the code LINDENFI or the free Dine and Dash. Linden DD is the code for that when you buy a G3 kennel at Dakota283.com. And once you let them out of the crate, then you want to put on the dog to a T and B dual electronic training collar. Got all sorts of things going for it, including two sets of buttons so you don't have to toggle back and forth. Another thing that I really like, these guys have finally thought about stuff that's bothered you and me and others for a long, long time, including where that beeper horn is. Now, in the new T and B dual, the entire unit, the stimulation, the horn, the vibration, all that is in one little black box, and it hangs down, not up around the ears of your dog. Speaking of hearing protection, 
your dog's not going to go deaf because the horn is pointing down and away from his ears. Free shipping on any purchase over 200 bucks, 10% off all products over 200 bucks. Use the code SLUN10 at dogtra.com. And welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. My name is Scott Linden. His name, Todd Agnew, Spaniel trainer extraordinaire. Um, let's take a, a bit of a diversion here, Todd. And I, I would love to have your thoughts as a Spaniel guy on the question we have from one of our listeners today in our Handle It segment about the word woe the command woe, whether you use the silent command method or you just start with the word and you force it on a dog on top of the word itself. And this is why I'm looking to you, Todd, for this. Just listen for a moment, then give me your comments. I'm finding more and more often every dog I have is different, but more and more often, in addition to the word, uh, which does it's, it's needed once in a while. It is, especially with younger dogs on skittish birds or, or in a training situation or, or as you alluded to earlier, with, a, with bad quail in the field. Uh, other things help. My dogs are learning that woe is a word that says stop. So is a gunshot. So is the sound of a flushing bird. So is the sight of a bird. So that rather than all the other bad things that can happen. If any of those things happen, your dog is ideally at least ready to move to the next spot on your training or your hunting uh, strategy for that day. Now, you use HUP. Are there any similar similarities between what I'm just saying and how you train your dogs to sit down when the bird flies? Sure, it's it, it's exactly the same. Whoa, when you started with the question, I, I'm I'm a little concerned that maybe um, your fan is thinking a Britney spaniel. Which is, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I because but, the, no, the but I'm not. Spaniels we want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um so that that being said, it's exactly the same. So the dog should sit down when the gun goes off. The dog should sit down when it you know, sees a bird in the air. Um, a lot of people, they use body language. They may put their hand up. We don't, but, you know, you see that kind of like the, the policeman with a stop sign. Sure, yeah. Um, so dogs are masters of association and body language. So with enough repetitions and being rewarded or corrected with those repetitions, then the dog will be able to figure that out. Groovy. I'm glad to hear that. And um, are, are there any of those, Is are there any that we might not have thought of? You brought up hand signal. That's one of my number one. And of course, that's why I forgot to bring it up. Um, uh, something maybe you use that we, we might use that might help in that regard, whether it's a uh, flying bird, shots, hand signals, word, a new word, what anything like that? No, um, you know, I, I kind of chuckle internally a little bit, Scott. To be honest, you know, not, none of us are that great, okay? As, oh, a, yeah. as a dog, <laughs> as a dog trainer, okay? Um, there, there aren't that many new things that come along. So the same stuff from 25 years ago, other than maybe some behavioral things, because we just know more about canines now than we did then. Yeah. But the the methodology of the training. It really doesn't vary that much. There's a there's a great book. I think it was originally published in 1914 from Charlton about its spaniels. You know, they're breaking. You know, for field trials and so forth. It is still to this day the best spaniel training book I have found. Now, there, of course, there's nothing in it about e collar, right? They didn't exist then, but the the underlying principles of it are the same as they are today. Okay. And then if you look at the pointing dogs, there's a, you know, there's, there's a wonderful pointing dog book um, called, you know, pointing dogs, the training and handle and by Cr uh, Krangle. And, you know, I think, I believe he's in the hall of fame. Uh, that book is as good today as it was back then. It's just the fundamentals of it. Dogs have always learned through association. Things that are positive or negative have meaning to the dog. I mean, that doesn't change over time. So uh, for us specifically, it, it's everything you mentioned, that's exactly what it is, right? Because we all hunt, so, so we all have a gun, regardless of breed. We, we all have a whistle. 
we all have our voice. <laughs> you know, we all are going after birds. So those things are not going to change uh, unless, you know, there's some style of hunting I'm not aware of. You know, let me just, let me just add to that. There are no shortcuts. Am I right? <laughs> I, 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 the, the shortcuts might get you through the weekends, but they don't get you through the years. Amen. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that I finally came up with something that really <laughs> matters. Um, uh, I, I want to talk, th this is a big one for us. And, and again, I, I confess I'm, a, I'm pretty active in NAVDA and, and you know, somebody mm -hmm. else is active in uh, AKC or American field or NASTRA or anything else. You know, there is a divide to a great degree between um, uh, hunt tests, if you will, and field trials or any dog game and hunting. I think you're, you're, you're contending that high level competition is probably a good thing for a spaniel at least. Level competition? High level. Oh, high level. It, it, it is. Um, so almost every call we get, cold call that we get, the first thing someone's going to say to us is, I don't want a field trial dog. Now, keep in mind, most times these people have never seen a field trial dog. They've never been to a field trial. Okay. For us, I'm, I'm well aware of the divide that you talk about. And given the power of the anti-community, we should stop trying to cannibalize each other and just understand that there's a game for everybody, whatever that is. And if that brings them joy and they're pro dogs and pro guns and pro hunting, then who am I to tell you that, you know, you shouldn't be, or you're not doing it right. I, I just think that's very short sighted, but that being said, I'll speak just for the Spaniels. There is only one test out there that is, it is pitting one dog against the other, and that, that's the AKC's uh, Springer Spaniel or Cocker Spaniel field trials. And in Canada, the Cockers run with the Springers, but in the States, they're a separate circuit. Um, if somebody calls us and they don't want a trial dog, um, you know, that's fine. I don't, it makes no difference to me if anybody ever wants to run a field trial. There's, I can spend hours telling you everything I don't like about the field trials. But there are things that are wonderful about the field trials. So in the past three years, since we went back and were serious, we were never full-time field trialers until we just took enough heat from some people. And, you know, we just went back because I'm like, fine, we'll show you. So two years ago, we had high point dog in the country. Last year, we won the national. Um, so, you know, but I, I'm no different. Our business hasn't changed. It's, it's, a, it's, really a non-factor other than it's competition but for anybody that doesn't want a field trial dog they're really cutting uh, their potential enjoyment everybody should have an opportunity to hunt over a dog that won a national that's a field champion there are no bad dogs that won a national i think what happens is people they have a bad experience and there's plenty of them out there, Scott, mm -hmm. the field trial, the field trial people are notorious for dumping dogs with problems on the hunting community. Okay. So this is, this is not that all field trial people are good and we've always been upstanding and done the best thing, but we're bad with education. We walk around pompous, like we're better than everybody else. And it's a travesty. It really is the hunt test. I personally have some serious problems with the hunt tests. I think that the standard is way too low. Dogs pass that should never be passing. Uh, you know, there's a whole circuit of judges that are always the same. They've never hunted. They've never trained a dog. They're show people judging what dogs should be doing in the field. It, it's a lack of education more so than it is a, a lack of effort, let's say. Yeah, and I, and I might just add that's also true in many of the pointing breed hunt tests, and I'm I'm seeing that more and more. I I just totaled up that I'd I'd been involved in one way or another in fifty different NAVDA tests, and I I see exactly what you're talking about in terms of the standards and how they're way more flexible than they theoretically should be. I think it's okay, right? I mean, it's supposed to be against a standard. They're not supposed to be, you know, pinning one dog against the other. 
But here's a blatant example. The Spaniel hunt tests have allowed, I don't know, a dozen, 15 different breeds that can go do that. On the surface, I think that is great. More people participate, more people pro-gun, pro-dogs, blah, 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 blah. The problem I have is that all those separate breeds, they all wrote what the standard was in the field. And if you go and you read them, every flaw is written into that that's normal for the breed. And so you'll, you will actually see participants go to the judge and hand them the printout. Well, this is what a clumber is supposed to do. This is what a Welsh is supposed to do. And we have those in the kennel. But under no circumstance should a spaniel, a flushing dog, slow down on the flush. Under no circumstance. Yet all of those breeds write in that that's normal, that's okay. How can the breed improve if that's what you are rewarded? I, I guess it depends on how you wrote the standard. And, and, uh, well, and what, exactly. what you're, what, uh, like you said, and like I said too, it's uh, uh, the standard is becomes flexible, not only on paper, but also that day with those judges and that dog. And, uh, and that kind of becomes problematic down the road. I agree. We can go off on into the weeds on that one for a long time, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. but let, let's talk about everything that's more fun and, and probably of more benefit to everybody else. Um, and that is, uh, as we talk, I believe you're heading north very soon to to actually hunt some wild birds and and maybe do some other things, maybe some training on wild birds. But the whole concept of uh, wild birds and how how to train dogs to handle them, I think I think you have some views on that that may be different than a lot of people. And and number one, you're lucky enough to be able to have access to them. But number two. How does that relate to you and me and everybody else who's trying to train their dog, period? Well, you can't control the situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's a test of where your training is. Um, obviously, we're dealing with domesticated dogs. And if the wild birds survive nature, um, you know, it's going to give our dogs a run for their money. Uh, I think that what the wild birds do is it builds confidence with young dogs in particular, these trips are really about the young dogs, mm -hmm. not, you know, Dudley, who's eight, he's made the trip so many times, he's never going to be any better than he is. Uh, but for the young dogs, you know, this could really, you know, pull them out of their shell. Uh, now I'm so, really confused now, Todd, by the way, that's okay. Todd Agnew with Craney Hill Kennels, spanieltraining.com. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Um, hope you'll keep listening. Uh, so how does, how do wild birds build confidence in young dogs? I mean, that is, th there's the nexus. All right. That's the $64,000 question. So all of us, I believe, um, start dogs off with pen raised birds and, you know, you get the dogs comfortable with the flush and if he's shooting and, and whatnot. But when you get to a wild environment, it's just, you know, there's no comparison. It's so much more difficult for the dog to be successful. But when the dog is successful, when the dog learns to stick with it, when the dog learns to trust its nose, there's a inherent confidence that the dog gains that when difficult situations arise, cover, birds, scenting, they don't quit. Yeah. What about before that? when they're failing on wild birds, how do we keep them motivated? <laughs> you, put, you put them down again. Yeah. And again. Yeah. And again. So this isn't a two day trip. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, our dogs are going to be on wild game for, you know, let's call it six to eight weeks a year. And so it's day after day after day. And what will happen generally, we're going to have a group of really young dogs, less than a year of age. And we're, they're all going to run together. So I will have six, eight, ten, whatever it is, puppies just out there running around. No rules, no whistle, not talking to them. We're just going for a walk. The power of numbers is that somebody's going to bump a bird or somebody's going to, the noise is going to scare a bird. And one of those dogs is going to see it or two of them. And they're going to chase. And so now they're going to run a little bit bigger. Well, over time, they start saying, hey, there's stuff out here. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. If we start off with eight puppies, after X amount of time, two of those puppies are going to be the ones finding all the birds. So we're going yeah. to pull we're going to pull them out of the group, mm -hmm. and they will run separately. Just those two. 
Then the other six are going. And then suddenly there'll be one or two that now they're finding the birds. They will now get dropped into the group of two and our development group will now be down to four or whatnot. So you're constantly pulling the best ones out so the best run with the best. But keep in mind, they're only the best that day. Sure. This has no, it doesn't have any last in, like this dog was great today, so I now think this is the one. I'm looking at the dogs at the end of the fall. Got it. And it makes all the sense in the world. And, and of course, that, you know, everybody you ask says, yeah, we should always be always training on wild birds. But some of us don't have that opportunity, whether it's the regulations, it's where we live, it's any other uh, limiting factor. What can we do uh, with domesticated birds, whether it's pigeons or pen raised quail or anything else? Is there anything we can do to ensure that the dog is still learning? And I don't want to say ensure that we're simulating wild birds. I don't think you can do that. But is there anything we can do as just Joe Blow in, in our own backyard or in our own back forest to, to help or to speed along the evolution, the development? Um, Some place there's going to be a bird of choice depending on where you live. Yeah. It could be, it could be access to birds or it could be the genetics of the birds. So when we lived up North quail were terrible. I mean, they were just horrible. We'd run Johnny houses and birds all died or they didn't recall down here in the South quail is King. It's the best game bird we get. They fly the strongest. They're, they're just the best bird for us. So the first thing is figure out what is the best bird for you. If you can run a covey bird, then you can run a Johnny house. So whether typically chucker or quail, if you can run a Johnny house, that is by far the single best thing that you can do. Get the more you flight the birds, the stronger they get, the, you know, the better they get, the harder they are for the dogs to get. That would be what I would do. Love it. Amen to that. And, uh, and many of us are trying to get to that point. Um, uh, Johnny house, uh, if, if you're really new to this game, just Google it. Um, but it's a way to store birds, house birds, and get them to come back to that spot uh, with a little less uh, manhandling literally involved in this whole thing. Todd, um, a lot of my listeners are pointer guys. Uh, some of them even own Labradors. Um, anything in general that you might want to suggest for, for in terms of our hunting abilities or our training abilities that you've seen over the years that that could help us become better dog owners just like number that. Uh, number one hunt your dog yeah it, without a doubt it will improve your ability to trust your dog read your dog with without a doubt um but th there's a couple of things that uh, I, I think philosophically will take some some brain drain that people need to get comfortable with. Everybody's heard of the pack leader. I mm -hmm. mean, that's been beat to death for the last, you know, 25 years. Um, the problem with the pack leader is that only one side of the story has ever been told. So all the marketing, it's be the leader of the pack, be in charge, let the dog know that you're in charge, you're the leader. It's all this correction dominance type of story but the leader of the pack also provides safety good hunting grounds and keeps the pack harmonious and that story really doesn't get told by disney and the rest of them okay so be i am not soft don't misunderstand me but be kind to your dog and what i mean by that is be fair to your dog your dog doesn't know anywhere near as much as you think it does. And I'll give a simple example to test it. So walk your dog at heel and tell your dog to sit. Now, before everybody tells me that their dog will do it, the next time you do it, don't stop when you tell your dog to sit. And before everybody tells me, nope, my dog will do that. The next time, don't turn and look at your dog when you tell your dog to sit. There are very few dogs out there where somebody can just walk at a normal pace while they're walking, say sit without interrupting, slowing down, turning their body, giving some cue to the dog that it is supposed to sit. Yet everybody, when they come to our seminars, they'll all, no, my dog knows it. And, and, and there isn't anybody yet that their dog has known it. So be kind to your dog and, and you gotta understand 
the dog does not know nearly as much as you think it does. I, I just want to amplify the one word you used in there that I, 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 it hit on me as I was scratching one chapter together on a book a while back, and that's that whole idea of fairness. It may not be envisioned by the dog the same way we do, but there is an element of that. Can you, can you kind of expand on that a little bit? To me, fairness is consistent. Ha. Good, good or bad. So you don't, you don't reward a dog today for a lousy effort and then only reward it for a great effort tomorrow. You don't punish the dog for getting on the couch today, but because you had a bad day, you let it get on the couch tomorrow. It's consistency. That's what's fair to the dog. They thrive in that environment. Dogs actually can absolutely thrive under a tremendous amount of pressure. And I mean mental pressure. I don't mean beating dogs up and stuff. But they can thrive as long as it's fair. As long as they have an escape, they understand what the, what the pressure is for and how they can get out of the pressure. Thank you. Uh, glad to hear that again in that way. So you're going up there or you're mm -hmm. not, you're down there. Um, sometimes you probably get to carry a shotgun. Sometimes you're actually simulating hunting. Um, do you ever actually go hunting? That's what we're doing. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I understand we're, we're dog trainers. Okay. So it's training 24 seven. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. But uh, for example, uh, the young dogs now, right now, that young group, they'll come every time they're called. Yeah. Um, they'll sit every time they're told. When we get up to Maine and then out to Kansas, believe me, they are not going to be that good. <laughs> they will, they, but they will never, ever get corrected on this trip. Yeah, I love it. And by the way, off mic, we'll have to talk about that Kansas part of your trip. Maybe I'll see okay. you there. <laughs> but uh, so, so you're out there, you're doing all the things. And number one, you're doing them with spaniels. And that's, that's cool. What is it about all of that? I mean, especially in a real, well, as real as it gets, however you define that, in a real hunting situation, what is it that just trips your trigger? What, what, how do you get your, the hair on the back of your neck to stand up? What causes that for you? A spaniel taking a running bird. Oh, yeah. By, <laughs> by, by far, when you have to sit that dog down, or, you know, you sit the dog down four or five times so you can catch up and release the dog and it gets back on it. And then that dog finally wins and puts that bird in the air that'll get your, that'll get your blood pumping. Oh yeah. Now, now I, just because I've, I've read a lot of those old books you were talking about earlier and, and, you know, back in the day they'd, they'd fence in a half an acre and put a couple bunnies in there and get the dogs real excited about chase, chase, crash, 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 crash. How do you get that now? Same way? Um, how do we, I'm, I'm not following I, I, the going in hard on a, a hard flush. Uh, how it's, do you, gene it's, it, it's genetic. Really? Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's genetic. So um, we would classify Riot that won the national. Mm -hmm. You know, his flush is, I mean, just off the chart. I mean, it's when he wins a bird, I, there is no confusion. It's like a missile launch going in, going in for the flush. Okay, that's an A dog to us. Okay, that's, that's how the dogs win nationals. That's how the dogs win trials. Then we have, that's not normal. Okay. Anyone that thinks that all those trial dogs are A dogs, they're just misinformed or, you know, it, it's somebody promoting something that really isn't there. The field trials are not filled with great dogs. There are great dogs out there, but that's not the norm. Most of the dogs are really nice, high level dogs. They're just not at that next level. Can you tell that early on? Um, I think you can see signs, but in addition to that drive and flush, um, the dog's got to be trainable. And, you know, we're going to split hairs here. I can't remember the last time I worked with a Spaniel that was not trainable. Mm -hmm. I mean, these days, you know, in, the, in our clientele and, you know, the, the people that we're working with, you know, the genetics are really powerful. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're all trainable to a high level the level that is required and for for the listeners anybody that hunts over a really talented spaniel that is not trained it will be the most miserable hunt in your life 
because they will never be in range. You will never get to shoot and they will rid the field of any game. Yeah. <laughs> okay. and, and you'll never realize it. You, maybe you didn't even realize that dog was, was, could have been a rock star. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, but now that could happen because the dog is untrained, but it could also happen because the dog is untrainable. I mean, I, I don't yeah. have that answer, yeah. that answer, but so even though really young, we've got a, a riot puppy here right now. That is, I mean, all I'll say is she's not for sale. So <laughs> around here, around here, that means we're really high on her. Now she's, I mean, she's got a ways to go, but, but genetically it looks like she's got a lot of really nice things. Is she going to be mentally stable enough between the ears to get to that highest level? Time will tell. Love it. And good luck. I Thank have you. a feeling I know how this story is going to end. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned a couple old timey books that uh, that uh, are still uh, uh, r really relevant to us, whether it's old or it's new or it's somewhere in between. Besides my book, which everybody should rush out and buy right now. Yeah, right, right. Um, what other book or two should a bird dog owner slash self trainer, if you will, really okay. read carefully. And obviously without our stuff, yeah. I would buy, I would run out right now and buy Mike Gould's book, the shooting Labrador, mm -hmm. the shooting, shooting Labrador dog or the Labrador shooting dog. Okay. okay? I, I believe it's out of print, but you can still find it. Um, uh, Mike is really good dog guy. Um, he's a naturalist. Things are done in a more natural type of environment and, and philosophy. Mm -hmm. You do have to kind of bite your tongue with some of the, you know, the, the complaining about trials and all those other things. But like I said, you know, earlier, we all have bias of how we view things. But in there is a lot of good stuff, uh, particularly about fairness, about um, elasticity and, you know, training for confidence versus compliance. Um, it's really, it's a really good read. I would, I would highly recommend that. You know, there's that word again, confidence. It, it really does come up a lot because it really is more important than a lot of so-called trainers want uh, to, want to uh, admit. It, it, it is, you know, one of, one of the big differences in the lab world, which I have a tremendous amount of respect for, I just don't want to do it, is that almost everything they're going to ask that dog to do, it's going to begin next to the handler. Okay, so that all that obedience and stuff is really, really important. But the Spaniel, similar to the pointing game, we need the dogs to be away from us finding game. Well, if we're so worried about compliance that the dog is afraid to go out there and make a mistake, it's going to be really hard to find game. Yeah, we've seen that. I mean, one of our little training group uh, guys has a four-month-old. It's a Griffon, but don't hold that against him. Mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> but this dog, it, it, it's so early in its development, I'm using the right word already, um, that uh, it needs to build that confidence. And so, you know, every Thursday night, that's the number one priority for this little dog. And, and from week to week, you can see it happening. But you only do that by doing, well, in, in, a, in a way, what you're doing up there in Maine, and that's turning them loose and letting them figure things out. Yeah, if you... You can't change genetics. Yeah. You just, you can't. The, the dog has what the dog has. But what you can do is change the situation and increase the opportunities. That's why we're going on these trips. That's why we do it. It's, you know, if we have some dogs in for training that we think have some high opportunity, they got to make that trip because they're only young once. They're only in that development, that impressionable stage once. If our older dogs, never went on the trip. They sat home here in the kennels. It's not going to matter in their bird finding. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not going to learn anything more up there. But for the young dogs, it can be monumental. And even dogs that we go on those trips with that we're not happy with when we get back, when we get back, they're significantly better even in training. Love it. So they did get something out of it, just maybe not as much as we'd hoped. Um, I want my listeners to get one more thing out of this, and that is you've you, you've you've been there, you've done that, you've got more T-shirts about it than you need to, to own. 
you deal with a whole bunch of people like us, whether we're buying a dog from you, we're leaving a dog for training, we're just we're going to one of your seminars. Uh, by the way, you can learn all about that at SpanielTraining.com. But whatever it is, you, you deal with a lot of schmoes like me. What is your number one caution? What is the one thing that we most of us do that we should probably avoid at any cost? You're not patient enough. Yeah. You expect too much too soon. Thank you. Okay. Stop listening to, you know, the guy that is hunting over his dog when it's six months old. Yeah. Or someone got a ribbon and, you know, seven months old. You know, we talked about the hunt test, which is against a standard, which in essence means none of us are competing against each other. All you have to do is go walk in those galleries and listen to everyone complain about everybody else's dog. And you realize it's completely a competition. It defeats the whole purpose of us all going out there and trying to get our dogs better so that we can say we had the youngest dog to do this or we had the most passes or all those other things. Everybody just slow down. You're training the dog for the life. I don't care about the dog at six months. Show me it when it's three. You know, it's funny. I just posted on my Facebook page another discussion about growth plates in puppies and how how damaged they can become if we do too much too soon. Mm -hmm. I never thought about that as a way to scare people from getting too competitive <laughs> too early. <laughs> well, Scott, you know, people are people, so you can say it all you want. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm completely about the dogs. So for me... It, I'm never going to change the breed. I'm not going to live long enough. I'm not going to have enough litters, but I firmly believe in education and all walks of life. It's the most valuable thing out there. I truly believe that. So if I can just help educate a little bit, then I think that's my best way to make some Spaniels lives better. Man, you just did it. And we're, you know, uh, we could go on forever, but we'll do this again when you get back or maybe when we're both in Kansas, that would be kind of cool. Um, Todd Agnew, Craney Hill Kennels, SpanielTraining.com. Find out more about his dogs, his philosophy, upcoming seminars, and all the other cool stuff, and some videos with great little Cocker Spaniels running around in the woods. I mean, if you need, if you need a smile today, go to the website. Todd, uh, anything you want to leave us with? Uh, just everybody, good luck and be safe. What a concept. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I'm glad we could get this together, and I'll see you in the field soon, I hope. Thank you, Scott. And stick around, because this land is your land is coming right up. That's your public access tip from me and my friends, places that we love that you might as well. But first, this from ESPamerica.com, hearing protection that, uh, hey, I'm a, I'm a big believer. I've been gunning a lot for some of our club's training days and, in fact, looking forward to gunning at the hunt test next weekend. But in the meanwhile, I just want to remind you that, you know, ear protection is not just for the range. You get the right kind of hearing protection, and you can browse all of the selections at ESPamerica.com, and it will enhance your hunting and your bird dog training and testing world as well you are able to adjust the volume level on these ESP devices to hear your friends' voices, uh, block out most of the wind. You'll be able to hear skittish dogs or hinky birds. If you're using bird launchers, you can hear them. It's all right there. And then when you pull the trigger, the big bang becomes a little pop, and you are good to go. Hearing protection will prevent that cumulative hearing loss that is inevitable otherwise. ESPamerica.com. Get more information. I'm a believer. You ought to be as well. All right. Welcome to This Land is Your Land, and it is, whether it's owned by us or our states and our counties and our feds, lease it so that we can access it here's another one for you this from my good friend cletus bianchi at laylaps gps in montana head for the flathead in the cold creek national forests if you are interested in chasing cor uh, quarry that includes every well every realistic species of forest grouse it's up near glacier national park so it's way north you want to go early in the season 
check your regulations, but there's still logging taking place out there for some unknown reason. And that's a good thing because it, that creates the good habitat for roughies, blues, and even some of the spruce grouse. You'll find roughs in the creek bottoms, blues on the drop-offs, and spruce grouse in the higher altitude uncut forest, the older stuff, the big trees. Looking for good information? Stop in at the Forest Service office in Hungry Horse, Montana, and then, of course, keep your eyes peeled for grizzlies. Upland trivia question coming up next right after this from our friends at Dogtra.com. Dogtra, mm, I'm loving that T&B dual training collar. It comes with a beeper. It comes with a vibrator. It comes with a tone. It, and it comes with two parallel sets of controls. And that's what I like most about it. 10% off for any purchase over 200 bucks. Just use the code S L U N. 10 S L U N 10 at dogdra.com and uh, hope you will take advantage of that great offer and tell them I sent you free shipping on any purchase over 200 bucks as well. All right. So it's time for the trivia question this week, the prize, a Pete shoe dryer. And if you don't have one yet, man, you're, you are missing out Pete shoe dryer for somebody who answers this question correctly at Scott Linden outdoors at gmail.com. Here's the question. In what state can you hunt Himalayan snowcock? Yeah, right here in the United States of America, you can hunt Himalayan snowcock. Got to jump through a few hoops and climb about 10,000 feet. But one state right here in our vast United States will let you do that. Scott Linden Outdoors at gmail.com. That's where you submit your answer. Good luck. Somebody's going to take home a Pete shoe dryer. And now, my thanks to you for sticking with us. My thanks to Todd Agnew for the insightful thoughts and interesting philosophical discussion. I hope everybody else learned as much as I did about spaniels and training and uh, all the things that we might be able to apply to our own situation. If so, tell your friends, have them check out the Upland Nation. You can learn more at uplandnation.com. Join me at the Facebook page of the same name. Please leave us a positive review. If you got any suggestions, advice, guests we should talk to, send me a note at the Facebook page or at scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com. Hope you had a good time. Thanks again for listening. And we'll see you in the field.